Are Godzilla's flying monsters big enough? Uh... As our imaginations, our appetites for cinematic destruction, and our CGI budgets get bigger, so too do our favorite movie monsters. Since his first appearance in 1954, the King of Monsters himself, Godzilla, has increased in size almost 60% on the silver screen, forcing all the other kaiju that he battles, especially the flyers, to scale with him. But are they big enough? Start the science! This may seem like a silly question. Beasts like Rodan, Mothra, and Ghidorah are absolutely enormous in the latest Godzilla film. Still, thanks to physics, if there are any kind of realistic constraints on how big Godzilla can get, there would be similar constraints on how big flying monsters should be. Specifically, can we figure out how big their wings should be, how much power it would take just for them to get off the ground, and how much wing flapping would all of that take? It might be the case that these these creatures need to be even bigger. First, how do things fly? No matter if you are a tiny fighter jet or a giant flapping wing beast, flight is basically just overcoming two different forces with some forces of your own. Everything on a planet has weight, and so if you just want to get off the ground with wings or engines or what have you, you need to supply a lift force that either cancels out, equals this weight force in the opposite direction, or it exceeds it, or else you will be grounded. The second force you need to overcome is a drag force, which depends on the shape of the object moving through the air, the density of the air, the velocity you're going at, etc. It's kind of like a pulling force acting in the opposite direction that you want to go. What you want to do then is supply some kind of thrust force to cancel out this drag or exceed it or else you're just going to stay motionless in the air and not go forward or in any direction. What's critical here is that the larger the creature or flying thing, the more mass it will have and the more drag it will experience. And on Earth, with specific gravity and specific air density, this puts a real biological limit on even our best flyers. The beautiful thing about evolution is that even though there are innumerable variables that force animals on Earth to look and act the way that they do, there seems to still be an infinite number of solutions to the problem that is life. Take flight, for example. Flight did not come from a common ancestor. It evolved independently four separate times in birds, in bats, in insects, and in pterosaurs. These animals are obviously very different, but they all converged on a similar solution. For example, they all have wings, and yet bird wings and dragonfly wings operate very differently. Thanks to the variety of evolution, there is a huge range in the size of our flyers. The smallest, a parasitic wasp of the genus Dicopomorpha, I cannot even show you on this scale that you're seeing me on because its wingspan is literally the width of a sheet of paper. Though if you were to zoom in, it would look something like this. Adorable and parasitic, wow. I would also have a hard time showing you the largest flyer that we know of, a pterosaur from the late Cretaceous period of the name Quetzalcoatlus northropii. It had an amazingly wide wingspan, 11 meters, 36 feet, just 65,000 times wider than the parasitic wasp's wingspan. These two animals seem so very different, and yet they converge. And so we can use the relationships between flyers like this to make real conclusions about, yes, even fictional monsters. <laughs> Huge again. Obviously, the ginormous flyers in the monsterverse like Ghidorah are much larger than the largest flyers to ever live. I like that three-head look. Pulling very generally from all the Godzilla canon over the years, we know that these beasts are absolutely ginormous. In the new film, Mothra, for example, has a wingspan over 800 feet wide, and Rodan is half the weight of the dang Titanic. The question we want to ask, though, is, is this big enough? If we apply the relationships between flyers on Earth, how would Mother Nature actually scale these monsters if they were real Creatures, what? Yes, you can still be the king. Yes, I know that three heads would be wearing multiple crowns and that would be better. What? I don't, yes, pollen is good, very, like, 
230? I don't know where Brian Cranston is. I don't know any of these questions. If Godzilla's Titans had wings that scaled like all the flyers on Earth, the MonsterVerse would get even bigger. If we were evaluating planes, everything would be a lot simpler. Planes like fighter jets have engines for thrust and fixed wings to provide lift. A flappy flap real animal though, with each flap changes a number of variables from wing span to wing area to just the angle of attack of the wings. So things are gonna be more complicated than just a simple equation that solves everything. I do not have one of those. What I do have though is research. Research like flight and the scaling of flyers in nature. Research like this looks at all the flyers that we know of and tries to relate them to one another and then come up with some kind of empirical relationship to say if one bird was this size, then it should have X variable or X wingspan. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use this real research to resize our monsters to see what actually fits. Let's start with Ghidorah. From observing vertebrate flyers, we know that there is a relationship between the mass of the flyer and how much power is required from their flight muscles just to get their bodies off of the ground. And that relationship looks like this. So for example, if you had a very small bird of just one tenth of a kilogram, it would take a little less than one watt for it to get off the ground in terms of power. And if you had a much, much larger bird at 10 kilograms, kilograms, it would take around 100 watts of power. 100 watts is around what a light bulb puts out, and it doesn't sound like that much, unless you've ever tried to power one by riding on one of those bicycles that makes you really tired. From empirical observation of many different kinds of flyers, when we plot it all out like this and try to draw some kind of line that best fits all of our observations, we actually do get a mathematical relationship that relates all of them. So power required from flight muscles is proportional to how many times more massive a bird is to the power of 7 6. That's just how the math works out. So for example, if a bird was twice as heavy as another bird, it would require two to the seven, six times more flight power. Ghidorah, though, is a lot more than twice as heavy as anything. If we apply this scaling relationship to Ghidorah's tens of thousands of tons, we get a power requirement for its flight muscles just to get off the ground of 12 billion watts, 12 gigawatts, which is just about the same as how much power it takes for a dang space shuttle to get into space. So this is just spectacular sounding enough to make sense. However, rockets and space shuttles use chemical fuel. What would Ghidorah's wings really have to do that. The minimum number of flaps a flyer has to make per second in order to stay in the air also scales with mass. For example, a small hummingbird with a very small mass has to flap its wings a lot more frequently than a much larger bird with much larger wing area. Makes sense. Applying another scaling relationship to Ghidorah and you find that the minimum frequency that the wings have to flap at is 0.22 hertz, which equates to one wing flap every four and a half seconds or so, which I guess fits with what we see in Godzilla movies and kind of makes sense. However, our last scaling relationship is gonna change Ghidorah a lot. Y no, not the heads thing, you can keep the heads. Yes. Yes, I promised, dang. I think that we can say that Ghidorah is closer to a pterosaur than it is to a bird, so we are gonna scale its wingspan according to those ancient flyers. Going back to our research one more time and getting another scaling relationship for wingspan versus mass and applying that to Ghidorah, assuming that it is like a vertebrate flyer on Earth, which is a big if, but hey, this is a science show, Ghidorah's wingspan shouldn't be 175 meters. It should be three thousand meters, three kilometers wide. Now remember that Ghidorah is supposed to be a little less than 200 meters tall. This is absolutely enormous and possibly ridiculous. So let's visualize that. If we apply the wingspan scaling to Godzilla's airborne monstrosities, the king of monsters goes from terrifying to tiny. <sighs> I'm a monster. 
Here is our scaling graph in 100 meter increments, and here is our movie size Gittera. Now let's see what happens, I think you can guess, when we apply our scaling relationships to it. If we kept Gittera's height and body mass the same, this is how its wings realistically should scale up. <laughs> yeah, and this is Godzilla on the same scale. Doesn't really look like a fair fight anymore, does it? If Godzilla were to roar on one end of Ghidorah's wings here, one wingtip, it would take nine seconds for someone on the other side of Ghidorah to hear it. Ah! Ah, oh, my only weakness! Ah, uh, let's do the same wingspan math for both Mothra and Rodan. Using our same scaling equations, Mothra's wings go from this wide to this wide, over a kilometer and a half wide, and Rodan's wings go from this to 2,000 meters across. Now, is this more accurate scaling better? Is it cooler? Well, I happen to think that this portrayal is incredibly imposing and also incredibly awesome, but we haven't asked the most important question here for our purposes. Is any of this possible. Remember those two graphs of wing flap frequency and minimum power required from flight muscles that we looked at before? Well, I left something out of those. What I didn't tell you is that not only do we have scaling relationships for the minimum wing beat frequency and the minimum power required for flight muscles, we have the maximums for both of those too. There are outliers like the ancient Quetzalcoatlus, but beyond every single point on these graphs where these two lines meet is a maximum. Flyers cannot provide enough energy from their flight muscles, nor can they flap their wings fast enough just to stay off of the ground and actually fly. And that maximum is around 10 kilograms. Almost all the flyers on Earth that we know of fit within these small ranges. And in Ghidorah's case, it wouldn't be able to provide a thousandth of the power necessary or one tenth of the frequency necessary. It is way outside of the range on both of these graphs. So for big movie monsters to fly around, they would need otherworldly muscles that are extraordinarily efficient. Is that possible for them to have? Well, not really for biology as we know it, but is it possible for ancient Titan monster beasts to have? Uh, sure, maybe. Uh, what do you think? So, are Godzilla's flying monsters big enough? I don't think they're even close. Even if they had absolutely amazing muscles with a performance and efficiency unknown to science, their wings would still feasibly have to be bigger than we've ever seen on any screen. And I'm not even criticizing Godzilla here. Just like I need to see feathers on my velociraptors in movies, I need to see monsters with wings so wide that they would literally cast shadows that would cover cities. I say, make the monsters bigger and then let them fight, because science. Ow! Ow! I'm a monster. And there's a bigger problem with this whole thing that if you do not assume that the muscles of these flying monsters are already absolutely amazing and like nothing on Earth, they're still not gonna get off the ground because if you add more muscle to shrink their wing size or what have you, that adds more weight, which means they need a bigger wing size, which adds more weight, which means more muscle, which means more wing size, which means, so it's a kind of a loop uh, and uh, rockets deal with the same thing. How much fuel do you need to add per thrust, well, that adds more weight, which means you need more thrust, which means more fuel. So there's an equation that forces these animals to become absolutely huge unless their muscles are something amazing or, I don't know, they're, you know, from space or something. Thank you so much for watching, Max. If you want more of me or if you want to suggest ideas for future episodes, you can go here to these handles and do just that. Also, our first expansion show, Because Space, has the first two episodes now live, one with Archer himself in it. Yeah, you're gonna wanna check those out. Thanks again.